in this series, we looked at the various roles that violence has played in early examples of mystery and suspense fiction. We saw that not only are there many forms of violence in the genre, but also that some mystery and suspense narratives contain no violence at all, and instead center on such crimes as theft, fraud, and mistaken identity. With that said, there's little doubt that both the amount and the intensity of violence in the genre has steadily increased over time. So in the first part of this lecture, we'll focus on both examples of and reasons for this rise, concentrating in particular on the period between World War II and the present. In the final part of this lecture, our focus will shift somewhat as we discuss what types of violence mystery and suspense fiction tends not to focus on. Why? Because sometimes what is not in a genre can tell you just as much about it as what it actually contains. We'll start our investigation into how violence moved center stage in mystery and suspense fiction by looking at the work of a figure who by any measure is one of the most controversial figures in the genre. Mickey Spillane. Spillane was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1918. After serving in the Army Air Corps in World War II, where he was a fighter pilot and flight instructor, Spillane started writing, first of all, for comic books. When he and his wife wanted to buy a house in Newburgh, New York, Spillane decided to raise the money by writing a novel. The result was I, the Jury, which Spillane reportedly wrote in 19 days. It was published in 1947. The novel introduced Private Eye Mike Hammer, Spillane's most famous series character. To say that I, the Jury was successful would be a huge understatement. It sold millions of copies in the United States alone, and by the end of his career, Spillane was estimated to have sold over 225 million books. Hammer went on to appear in a number of other novels published in rapid succession, including My Gun is Quick, Vengeance is Mine, One Lonely Night, The Big Kill, and Kiss Me Deadly. As soon as the Mike Hammer novels began to appear, they became a lightning rod for criticism because of what reviewers regarded as the excessive amounts of sex and violence they contained. In fact, the more successful the novels became, the sharper the criticism became. Anthony Boucher, the famous mystery critic for the New York Times, criticized what he described as the usual Spillane sex come sadism. And in Mickey Spillane and His Bloody Hammer, a 1954 article that appeared in the Saturday Review, author Christopher Lafarge compared Hammer to the notorious anti-communist senator Joseph McCarthy. Mike Hammer is the logical conclusion, almost a sort of brutal apotheosis of McCarthyism. When things go wrong, let one man cure the wrong by whatever means he, as a privileged savior, chooses. Critics such as Lafarge were onto something, at least in the sense that Hammer was indeed a staunch anti-communist. A typical Hammer novel sees Spillane's detective being pitted against a much larger organization, such as a crime ring or the mafia, and communists obviously fit this bill very well. Hammer's battles with communists emphasize not only what a danger they represented, but also how the single figure of Mike Hammer was capable of defeating that danger. But what Lafarge and others tend to ignore and leave unexamined is exactly why Spillane's work, and especially at sex and violence, was so phenomenally popular with American audiences in the post-World War II period. Critics Max Allen Collins and James Trailer explain Spillane's success by saying that he had an intuitive understanding of his audience. A reading public that consisted largely of ex-servicemen who had fought a tough, brutal war, who would expect the violence and the sex of even their fantasy to reflect the loss of innocence of that war, who were, 
to put it less pompously if more crudely, a bunch of horny XGIs looking for a hot read. The seven novels Spillane produced between 1947 and 1953 have a level of sex and particularly violence that seems to come out of nowhere. But it did come from somewhere. It came from World War II. As Spillane's novels continued to be bestsellers, critics could deplore what they disliked about them all they wanted, and they've largely continued to do so. But there's no denying the appeal of what he wrote. In that sense, the Mike Hammer novels are a landmark in the representation of violence in mystery and suspense fiction. I use the word landmark here in several senses. First, in the obvious sense that Spillane's work contained both more and more graphic violence than anything seen before, with the exception of some of the more gruesome 19th century dime novels that focused on crime. Although Hammer is a fast shot, most of the time he seems to prefer hitting people with his fists, and the books are filled with graphic descriptions of broken bones, hoods getting their teeth knocked out, and people vomiting after Hammer punches them in the gut. But the Spillane novels are also a landmark in the sense that Hammer's violence is rarely presented as self-evidently good or unproblematic. In other words, Spillane frequently has Hammer justify the necessity of his tactics. It's true that Hammer occasionally doubts the efficacy of the way he always relies on violence, such as when he remarks to himself in One Lonely Night that, maybe I did have a taste for death. Maybe I liked it too much to taste anything else. Maybe I was twisted and rotten inside. Maybe I would be washed down the sewer with the rest of all the rottenness sometime. Later in the same novel, however, when his beloved secretary and love interest, Velda, is kidnapped by communists, we get a much more representative statement from Hammer about his commitment to the use of violence. I lived to kill so others could live. I was the evil that opposed other evil, leaving the good and the meek in the middle to inherit the earth. In this regard, it's important to emphasize a final landmark feature of the violence that Hammer uses. It's extra-legal, vigilante violence. Why is this important? Because it speaks to the way in which much of Hammer's audience, again, with the context of their World War II experiences and the developing Cold War in mind, had lost any confidence in the system that they might once have had. Specifically, Spillane's readers were unconvinced that the police and government could protect them adequately from such phenomena as rising urban crime and the threat of communist conspiracy and nuclear war. Hammer's audience, in short, not only tolerated but also celebrated his violence because they believed it was both necessary and effective. If Mickey Spillane's work speaks to a geopolitical context in a way that many of his readers and critics may not have expected, I don't think the same can be said of a novel that's very different from Eye the Jury and its successors, but that is just as influential in terms of how mystery and suspense fiction represents violence. I'm referring to Robert Bloch's famous 1959 novel, Psycho. Bloch was born in 1917 in Chicago and began his writing career at the suggestion of famous horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. Bloch was a big fan of the horror stories that Lovecraft published in pulp magazines during the 1930s, and after the two had exchanged a number of letters, Lovecraft suggested that Bloch try his own hand at writing. For the first part of his career, Bloch focused on publishing short stories in magazines like Weird Tales and Fantastic Adventures, but in 1947, he published his first novel, The Scarf, in which he takes on the persona of his protagonist, a psychopathic strangler. Despite the fact that the novel was poorly reviewed, Bloch went on to write a number of other novels with psychopathic protagonists, although not always using a first-person point of view, including a con artist in The Dead Beat and a pyromaniac in Firebug. But by far the most famous 
of Bloch's psychopath novels was Psycho. Of course, much of that fame can be attributed to Alfred Hitchcock's iconic film adaptation of Bloch's novel, but the novel also deserves to be read on its own terms. Why? Primarily because Bloch's Norman Bates is a genuinely memorable fictional creation. Although Hitchcock and his screenwriter, Joseph Stefano, made a number of changes to the character of Bates to make him more appealing to a film viewer, Bloch felt no need to make Bates palatable, and his book is all the better for it. Bloch's Bates is a thoroughly unpleasant character in every way, most of all because he not only murders Mary Crane, but then also beheads her in a scene that would have been considered very graphic for its time. Spillane can be said to have had a moral reason for depicting violence in a graphic manner in a way that perhaps helped to redeem or at least contextualize that violence. Can we say the same about Bloch's Psycho? Not really, no. Or at least not in as explicit a manner, but I don't mean that as a criticism of either Bloch or the novel. First, we need to consider the genre in which Bloch was writing, which owes as much, if not more, to horror than it does to mystery and suspense fiction. Although a crime is committed in Psycho, and that crime is investigated by both a private detective and by Mary's sister and boyfriend, and the perpetrator is even caught and arrested at novel's end, in my view, the crime in its solution is not really at the center of this narrative. What is at the center of Psycho? The character of Norman Bates himself. And this is where we arrive at the true significance of this novel in terms of its representation of violence in mystery and suspense fiction. As in many of his other novels, Bloch's focus in Psycho is to reconstruct in as dramatic and frightening a manner as possible the way a psychopath thinks and acts. This means that although there's no denying that Bates' violence is there, at least in part, to shock and appall the audience, it's also there to show us exactly what psychopaths are capable of doing, the motives and causes behind their acts, and what those acts mean to the people that commit them. The other point to bear in mind here is that Psycho was based on, or at least inspired by, a real-life case. In 1957, two years before Bloch published Psycho, police in Plainfield, Wisconsin, interviewed Ed Gein after Bernice Warden, a local hardware store owner, disappeared. When the police searched Gein's property, they found Warden's decapitated body hanging upside down in a shed, but this was just the beginning of what they would find. When questioned, Gein admitted to making a number of nocturnal visits to the local graveyard between 1947 and 1952, where he would exhume the bodies of recently buried middle-aged women that reminded him of his mother. He would then take the bodies back to his farm, where he tanned their skins to make various objects that the police found at his farm, including a waste paper basket, a belt, a lampshade, and even a corset made from a female torso. To put it bluntly, next to real-life horror like that represented by the Ed Gein case, anything in Bloch's novel seems very mild indeed. At the very least, we can say that mystery and suspense narratives that focus on psychopathic characters, especially characters inspired by real-life models, must necessarily include an unusual amount and intensity of violence in order to capture both their reader's attention and the truth of what psychopaths are capable of doing. It's no exaggeration to say that Robert Bloch's Psycho is the direct ancestor and inspiration for the explosion of fiction that centers on psychopathic and especially serial killers that began in the 1970s and peaked in the 1980s and 1990s. What does this later fiction share with Psycho in terms of its representation of violence, and how does it differ? Let's take Thomas Harris's famous novel, The Silence of the Lambs, as an example. 
Like Block, Harris draws on real-life cases in creating his serial killer characters. Buffalo Bill, for example, pretends to have an injured arm in order to trick his intended victims into helping him, a trick used by actual serial killer Ted Bundy. Also, Buffalo Bill's ambition to make himself a woman suit from the skins of his victims is an obvious allusion to Ed Gein. But the differences between Block and novelists like Harris are just as pronounced and important. For one thing, because Harris is writing novels about serial killers, rather than a standalone novel featuring a single psychopath, as in Psycho, there is necessarily more violence in Harris's work than there is in Block's. Moreover, because mystery and suspense fiction readers between 1959 and 1981, when Harris's most famous character, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, first appeared in print in Red Dragon, had perhaps become used to and even somewhat blasé about psychopaths in general, and serial killers in particular, the violence contained in such novels became not only more frequent, but also more extreme. We can see examples of this tendency not only in the work of Thomas Harris, but also in the work of those writers often grouped with him, such as James Patterson and Patricia Cornwell. In Kiss the Girls, for example, one of his novels featuring African-American forensic psychologist and detective Alex Cross, Patterson gives us not one, but two serial killers. Casanova abducts and then imprisons young women in underground cells, where he rapes and eventually murders them. The gentleman caller takes body parts from his victims and then keeps them as trophies. The two killers eventually meet and form a bond defined by mutual admiration, at which point they become a killing team. As for Patricia Cornwell, two of her novels featuring medical examiner Kay Scarpassa also feature serial killer Temple Galt, who, like Hannibal Lecter, is elusive, cunning, brutal, and derives great enjoyment from tormenting and terrifying not only his victims, but also the novel's law enforcement protagonist. The fact that Temple Galt evades capture in Cruel and Unusual and then returns in From Potter's Field illustrates the way in which later novels featuring psychopathic serial killers, and Thomas Harris's work definitely falls into this category, often keep bringing these characters back for encore performances. This is because they're the most reliable way of continuing to generate extreme violence in their narratives, and because they often share center stage with the law enforcement characters. Although, in fact, Lecter refuses to share the stage with anybody. This is a good time to acknowledge an unavoidable problem with these narratives. Their dependence on characters that commit extreme acts of violence repeatedly is both a strength and a weakness. It's a strength in the sense that their violence does a good job of establishing the stakes of the narrative. The more extreme the violence, the more the reader, at least theoretically, wants to see the perpetrator of such violence arrested or killed. But it's a weakness in the sense that if you write a series of narratives featuring such characters, you inevitably commit yourself to upping the ante a little more each time by making the violence more grotesque and explicit. The trouble is, you can only up the ante a certain number of times before one of two things happens. You either disgust your reader or, much more likely, you bore them. There are, after all, only so many things that one human being can do to another. And the more inventive you get in this area, the more you risk becoming over the top and ridiculous. Surely, I wasn't the only one who laughed in disbelief when we learn in Thomas Harris's Hannibal that Mason Verger wants to kill Lecter by having him eaten alive by trained boars. This seems more like something Dick Dastardly would dream up on Wacky Races. <laughs>
In a moment, I want to turn to the subject of the kinds of violence the genre tends not to be interested in. Before that, however, I want to backtrack a little to explore a final reason, apart from post-World War II anxieties and the advent of psychopath fiction, why the market for more extreme examples of violence in mystery and suspense fiction began to flourish in the 1950s. The easiest and most automatic criticism that one can make of violence in mystery and suspense fiction is to call it gratuitous. Unfortunately, gratuitous is an inexact term at best because it's so dependent on context. A particular act of violence, such as beating someone to death, may indeed be gratuitous in the context of a middle brow novel that has been recommended by the Book of the Month Club. But that same act may be read very differently by fans of pulp fiction. According to critic Lee Horsley, post-World War II American publishing was transformed by the introduction of the paperback. Again, we can thank the massive success of Mickey Spillane's work for inaugurating the boom in paperback publishing. Although the hardback version of Eye of the Jury sold relatively modestly, the paperback version went through the roof, and companies like Gold Medal were quick to take notice of this fact. In this way, the era of what became known as the paperback original, which refers to a book that was never published in hardcover, was born. Some of the most exciting and innovative mystery and suspense fiction of the 1950s appeared in the form of paperback originals. And because these paperbacks were beneath the critical notice of most reviewers, they gave writers an unparalleled degree of freedom to develop and express their own personal views, no matter how violent those views were. A brief discussion of the work of David Goodis and Jim Thompson will illustrate my point. Neither Goodis nor Thompson began their respective careers with the intent of publishing paperback crime novels, which they would have regarded as the ghetto of the publishing world. However, after their early attempts at publishing straight mainstream literary novels were unsuccessful, at least in terms of generating significant amounts of money, both Goodis and Thompson turned to producing paperback originals in order to make a living. Once they did so, they both found the genre to be surprisingly congenial. In Goodis's case, over the course of a series of novels, many of which are set in his native Philadelphia, beginning with Dark Passage in 1946 and ending with Somebody's Done For in 1967, he develops a relentlessly paranoid, dark, and fearful fictional universe filled with losers whose hope that things will get better is inevitably and brutally punished. As one might expect, violence plays a large role in Goodis's universe, but there's nothing gratuitous about it. Instead, in Goodis's work, violence serves as what the poet and critic T.S. Eliot once described as an objective correlative, that is, something that gives the reader access to traditionally inexplicable concepts. In other words, Goodis uses violence as a way to communicate with almost unbearable vividness the emotional texture of his fictional world. Far from being gratuitous, in Goodis's work, the intense and brutal violence suffered by his characters plays a foundational role. Although Thompson's vision of the world is just as dark and depressing as that of David Goodis, if not more so, there's surprisingly little violence in many of his crime novels, which stretch from Nothing More Than Murder in 1949 to King Blood in 1973. But, and this is a major exception, what violence there is usually makes a devastating impression, both because we're never allowed to look away from it, and because Thompson has a rare gift for conveying the full horror of violence to us. Two examples from many others will suffice to make my point. 
In The Killer Inside Me, the protagonist Lou Ford beats prostitute Joyce Lakeland nearly to death, and the description of the beating is very graphic. However, perhaps the most horrifying detail comes when Joyce tries to speak to Lou before she loses consciousness, and we realize that she's trying to say goodbye kiss. Later in the same novel, Lou is beating his fiancée, Amy, in a similar manner, and again, the description is very graphic. But once more, it's Thompson's eye for detail that makes this incident stick in the reader's mind. As Amy is dying, she reaches her hand out very slowly and grasps Lou's boot. Lou is so terrified that he can't shake it off, and we can't forget Amy's hand. Whenever I teach The Killer Inside Me, I always point out these details. Not because I like to make my students uncomfortable. Well, maybe I do. But because this is the way they can see that the violence in Thompson's work is anything but gratuitous. Through his uncanny eye for the uncomfortable detail, Thompson is able to convey the true horror of violence. You may have noticed that no matter how diverse they are in other respects, the examples of violence I've discussed in this lecture have one thing in common. They all deal with forms of interpersonal violence. Usually that violence takes place between a single perpetrator and a single victim, sometimes with a group of perpetrators and a single victim, and sometimes with a single perpetrator and a group of victims. Think of Mike Hammer laying waste to a room filled with communists but usually the numbers involved are pretty small. Why is this a significant detail? Despite the fact that mystery and suspense fiction is incredibly diverse when it comes to depicting both types and levels of violence, the genre does have one very noticeable blind spot, depicting collective violence in pretty much any form, whether that be a violent labor dispute, a riot, a revolution, or a war. I'm sure we can all immediately think of exceptions to this rule. Indeed, we discuss some of these exceptions in other lectures, such as when Chester Himes and Walter Mosley write about urban riots, or when Mukoma Wa Ngugi discusses the Rwandan genocide in his novel Nairobi Heat. My point, however, is that even if forms of collective violence do appear in the genre, they're usually in the background rather than the foreground of the narrative, and they certainly are not the focus of any investigation by the detective. Why is this? To be perfectly honest, I'm not absolutely sure, but my hunch is that it has something to do with how mystery and suspense fiction attempts to give meaning to violence. No matter what form it takes, who commits it, and why, mystery and suspense fiction seems committed to the principle that violence must not grow beyond a certain scale. Only in this way, it seems, can violence remain something that the genre can use rather than something that risks overwhelming it.